So we're transitioning seamlessly to dance safe from one form of harm reduction to another. Uh, I hope that, that most of you, maybe all of you, will stay. But if you do wish to leave, take this opportunity to silently make your way out any of the three exits. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce Mitch. While people are making their move, who here has volunteered for Dance Safe before? Anybody? Who here has had something tested by Dance Safe before? Yeah. Boy, how much do I appreciate that? I have a son who is 22. And he just went to a, a festival where he said everyone that he knows, he and all of his peers, absolutely always would test anything before ingesting it. And I think, like, what a great thing as a parent to know that my son has been brought up to know that that's part of how you keep safe. And I know that the reason he feels that way is because of the legacy of Dance Safe going back for 20, 25 years. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to see most of you are staying put. I'm going to go ahead and do an introduction. Hold on. The Queer Dome is at 745 and D. Yes. The Queer Dome is at 745 and D. Bam. Bam. <laughs> so I'm going to now introduce Mitchell Gomez, who's the executive director of Dance Safe. He has been in that position for five years. Um, he's been a harm reduction uh, advisor for MAPS uh, previously. And shoot, you just told me. What's the, and worked for the Burning, Burning Man Org, of course. And, you know, I've, I've known Dance Safe for, God, probably 20 or 25 years. And it was such a radical idea. I mean, uh, back in the day, I, I, I actually worked at the ACLU and I litigated a case in which the DEA arrested people in New Orleans at a rave because they said that the music promoted drug use. And the harm reduction measures that were there, thanks to Dance Safe, also promoted drug use. And so thankfully, the judge ruled you know, correctly that that was idiotic and also violated the First Amendment. But there's a long history of, of sort of leading up to where we are today. But I'm excited to hear Mitchell talk about what the present looks like, what Dance Safe is up to. And I'm just so grateful, Mitchell, for all that you're doing and your organization is doing. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm the executive dir director of DanceSafe. Uh, as he mentioned, I previously worked for the Burning Man Org. Uh, if at some point I can get a job with Meow Wolf, I'll have hit the hippie trifecta. All right, so those are the three organizations you have to work for to get the special ring. And, you know, so um, yeah, uh, my my interest in psychedelics actually radically predates my ability to get psychedelics. Uh, when I was very, very young, I sort of stumbled in the library across a copy of uh, Ralph Metzner and Timothy O'Leary's uh, book about psychedelics that was modeled on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And for a long time, I thought that psychedelics were a thing that had existed in the 60s, but that the government had successfully wiped them out, right? I mean, I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old. I was living in Tampa, Florida. I didn't, you know, I didn't have access to any of these things. I didn't know they still existed. Uh, the first time I ever realized that psychedelics were not just a thing that had existed, but were a contemporary reality was in my D.A.R.E. class, uh, when the, the officer who was teaching the D.A.R.E. class mentioned that there's this thing they can put on pieces of paper that might drive you insane or give you schizophrenia. You know, I'd, I'd already read enough about LSD to know that that was nonsense, but I did have some follow-up questions about the sort of people I should be looking to avoid uh, if I did not want to be uh, caught up in this, this horrible scourge of LSD. Uh, and he mentioned raves. Uh, it took me about two weekends to find one, uh, and yeah, I started going to electronic music events when I was 13, roughly. Uh, it took me quite a few years to find LSD, but I was doing MDMA by, by 13, 14. That was roughly the age when I first got access to that. Uh, it's just that psychedelics in Florida at that time period were something that a slightly older crowd controlled, and they weren't super down with sharing with 13-year-old Mitchell and his kickwares, uh, and so it took me a while. but. My, my motivation for harm reduction really stems from my personal use. Uh, psychedelics have been an incredibly positive and transformative part of my life. Uh, they're a thing that I genuinely believe saved my life. I had, I had some uh, issues when I was younger that were radically sorted out by my first LSD experience. And I'm first and foremost a cognitive libertarian. I just think that human beings have a right to alter their consciousness. I think that we own our bodies, we own our minds, or we don't. There's no gray ground. We're either free or we're slaves, and I think that we should be free. Uh, uh. And so, yeah, I, I really uh, 
have made it my life's work to make these choices that people make as safe as possible. Uh, the, you know, the only really, really, really true way to be 100% safe is to not engage in any substance use. Just like the only way to 100% make sure you never get an STI or get somebody pregnant is to not have sex. Uh, and saying that I'm just not gonna use drugs to me is just as absurd as saying, oh, I'll just never have sex, right? I mean, these are, I, I think actually co-equal drives in, in human consciousness. I think that the desire for sex and the desire to alter our consciousness are pretty equal in terms of how we experience them. I mean, as little children, we sort of intrinsically spin in circles as fast as we can, right? Nobody has to teach that to a little child, that if you spin really quickly, things get strange, and they, they're intrinsically drawn to that. It's a part of the human condition. And so we just know that most people aren't gonna follow that advice, and so we, we try to develop the tools and technologies that we need to make people's choices as safe as possible. Uh, that's my primary motivation. I have a really strong secondary motivation, which is protecting the medical research. Uh, the political optics of psychedelics are super heavily influenced by recreational use, re recreational use, uh, non-medicalized, non-ceremonial use of psychedelics. And every time somebody dies at a rave, every time somebody, you know, jumps off a building, which actually started out as a scare tactic and is now something that has happened. So people were saying that that had happened before it actually happened, but psychedelics are so heavily influenced by pre-existing thoughts and set and setting that I think we've actually created the conditions for people to do that by using that as a scare tactic. Every time that happens, the political optics for the medical research get a little harder. And so the less issues we have in these non-ceremonial, non uh, medical uses. I'm going to say recreational. Please just imagine the quotation fingers every time, right? Because I actually think that there's no such thing. Uh, but every time someone dies at one of these events, no matter what the underlying cause was, it makes the medical research a little more difficult. Uh, it makes the political conversation a little harder. Uh, and so I, Rick Doblin is probably the most influential person in my life outside of my parents and my wife. Uh, he's somebody who I've known most of my adult life, somebody who I've, I deeply love, and so I want to make his work as easy as possible. Uh, and so if we can keep people alive at the festivals, at Burning Man, at raves, at home, because often these psychedelic deaths actually take place outside of music events, uh, we can make his work easier. And I think the work is super important because the reality is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is the absolute best thing we have ever found for treating PTSD. And we have so many people in this country with, with intergenerational trauma, battlefield PTSD, uh, you know, sexual assault PTSD. There, it's just such a, a massive problem that we don't have an effective way to address until now. And now we do. And so, yeah, we, we really just try to develop these harm reduction practices. I really wish there was a clock in here. This is going to make it difficult. Uh, so if I yell out for the time every once in a while, that's what's going on. Uh, but really, harm reduction is just a way of dealing with uh, the negative consequences that are potentials with substance use or any other human activity, right? Harm reduction is sort of a broader thing. Condoms are certainly harm reduction, right? Seat belts, sunscreen, floaties for children who are swimming. In society, we all accept harm reduction all, to, all the time as part of what we do until we get to drug use, and then there's this massive political opposition to harm reduction. Uh, there were really sort of four groups that started this country there were, in terms of political echoes through time. Uh, there were the Native American confederacies, which were actually hugely influential in, in how we set up Congress and the Senate. Uh, there were the Hispanic settlers coming in through... Uh, you know, sort of coming in through what's now New Mexico and Colorado, but was then Mexico, uh, people who were sort of intellectually children of the Enlightenment and Puritans. And it's really important to remember these four strands when you're trying to figure out what's happening in this country, because that political history is real. There are really still people today who were raised by the children's 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 children of the Puritans. Uh, and this idea that things that are enjoyable should have negative outcomes is like a real belief in this country for a lot of people. Probably not a lot of people in this dome. And if you weren't raised in that, that tradition, it's actually hard to remember that and it's difficult, but it's important too because that's where a lot of the opposition comes from. The people who say we shouldn't give out condoms in high schools because it will encourage high schoolers to have sex are not just making the parallel equivalent to, oh, we shouldn't provide harm reduction for drug users. It's often literally the same people making that argument. Uh, and the answer for both is the same, right? People make the decisions they make, and if you don't provide these tools, they just do it anyway. 
Uh, and we know from the condom situation what happens when you ban condoms in high schools. You have massive waves of pregnant teenagers and sexually transmitted infections and sexual assaults because sex is this stigmatizing thing and you know, girls don't, or anyone sexually assaulted doesn't want to talk about it when it happens. And it's the exact same thing that happens with substance use. When you authorize substance users, and I'm talking all substance users, uh, not, just the, not just the sexy drugs, not just the drugs that maybe people here are, are on right now, I'm talking uh, all drug use. Harm reduction is something we should apply to all of it. Legalization and regulation, which I'll talk about later, is something we should apply to all of it. Uh, it's super easy to treat that as the other, right? The mythical capital O other, right? Oh, so like, People are dying from taking adulterated MDMA at these festivals. It's like, well, fuck them. Like, they shouldn't have been taking drugs, right? They shouldn't have been doing it. Uh, you know, opioid users are dying from fentanyl adulterated heroin. It's like, well, they shouldn't be shooting up, right? That's the sort of attitude that we have. Uh, we, you know, we uh, have. And it's difficult. We have to just accept, for better or worse, that drug use happens. We have to accept that first and foremost. That's step one. Drug use happens. Every civilization in the history of the world that had access to drugs used them. The only civilizations we don't know about that didn't use substances were some of the really far Arctic civilizations that existed before industrialization. There was absolutely nothing in their environment that could alter their consciousness. Uh, and so they didn't use drugs, but that's the only civilizations we know of. And as soon as you hit that edge of the Arctic ring where Amanita muscaria grows, uh, even though it's a pretty unpleasant psychedelic for most users, as soon as you hit it, people start using it. I mean, it's great if you like time loops, right? I mean, it's great if you like time loops, right? I mean, it's great if you like... Um, <laughs> so, uh, and so once you accept that drug use happens, you just have to deal with the consequences of substance use. And it's actually quite easy. Most of the people who die from what we think of as drug incidents are actually dying from the effects of prohibition. They're dying because drugs are illegal. They're not dying because of anything intrinsic to the drugs. Right? People who die because their cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin is adulterated with fentanyl, uh, and now a few cases of substances that were sold as MDMA or MDA adulterated with fentanyl, we've now confirmed a tiny handful of those as well. Uh, those deaths are 100% because of the lack of regulation and control within drug markets. Uh, people who are dying because they're waiting in line to get into a club and they see security coming and they have four pills in their pocket that they're planning on taking over maybe eight hours and they pop them in their mouth and then they die because MDMA at those doses is not the safest thing in the world. Uh, those people are dying because the, they were scared of going to prison. I mean, right? That's not a drug death. That's a drug prohibition death. Uh, and once you understand that drug use is complex, multifaceted, often non-problematic, and that it's going to happen, we can start implementing these tools. Uh, and a big part of this is that we can't minimize the actual risks of substance use. They're, these are potentially dangerous decisions you're making when we decide to try substances, and it's okay to be honest about that. Uh, MDMA, even at perfectly sort of appropriate dosage, the dosage they're, they're using for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, uh, I believe it's 120 milligrams to start with an 80 milligram booster. I'm sure there's someone in this room who knows it. it when Rick was talking, someone would have been able to answer, right, that there was a Even MDMA at those doses, if taken in a hot environment, you don't drink enough water, you don't take time to cool down, can kill you. Um, it's rare. Uh, we've lost more people. It's, to the best data to date, we've lost less people from MDMA since MDMA was invented than currently die from opioids every 30-ish days in this country. Um, so it's a much, much statistically less likely, less problematic type of drug use, but that does not change the individual deaths. Um, very often when people die, the, the parents end up reaching out to Dance Safe, uh, particularly when toxicology comes in, because when they hear their kid died from MDMA, they do some research, they realize that's probably not what happened, so they're waiting for the toxicologist to tell them what their children actually took, and then they find out their children actually took MDMA, and they get really confused, and so they often reach out to us. And the first question we always ask is, how hot was the venue? And it's almost always an answer in the triple digits. Right? They were in a nightclub that oversold capacity by 15% because it's cheaper to pay the fire marshal fine. Than you make, you, it's a smaller fire marshal fine than that 15% of tickets were, right? So they just make the economic decision to oversell the venue. You know, they didn't offer free water. They kicked people out who were sitting on the ground, so people were afraid to sit down and take some time to cool down. And that's a lot of the sort of data set of people who've died from these substances. 
And so, yeah, I'm, I, I talk to these parents all the time, and it's the, absolutely the hardest part of my job. Uh, I've been woken up by sheriffs wearing flak vests and cowboy hats to tell me that I'm no longer allowed to operate on site at 5.15 in the morning at festivals. And like, that's far easier than talking to the parents who, of children who died. Like, I'll take that every day because it's just so difficult. It, and so nothing minimizes these individual deaths, but we can really, really, really mitigate them. Uh, and so I want to talk about things that uh, we as a community can do to mitigate these deaths because a lot of events don't allow Dance Safe to officially set up, uh, including Burning Man. Uh, we don't have an official booth here. We don't have an official presence here. Uh, for most promoters, it's just pure cowardice. Uh, there are a few things in the federal BLM closure permit that allowing us to openly operate on site would have to be changed in the permit. Uh, and so th the org is one of the few organizations out there, the Burning Man org, that has a specific piece of legislation on their, on their permit they can point to that says, this is why we can't let you be here. So I make some allowances in my general anger about not being allowed to provide harm reduction. Uh, and so what we do is a distributed harm reduction outreach here. Uh, we bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of test kits. We distribute them to camps that we know need them. Uh, I have a whole bin over here for uh, if people want some after the talk. If everyone wants one, it's going to be a problem. So take one if you'll use it. Take one if you'll share it with your camp neighbors, with your friends who might need it. Uh, if you just want one out of curiosity, I don't have enough for curiosity. Um, we bring tens of thousands of earplugs. We have a uh, station set up at Camp Never Rest and out here at the Foam Dome. So if you need earplugs, we have two locations on Ply. You can pick those up. Uh, we ship, I don't even know how many condoms I shipped to Burning Man this year because it got so busy I lost track. Certainly over 30,000 condoms were shipped to various camps uh, this year, including the Orgy Dome. Uh, two years ago, the Orgy Dome ran out of condoms. They had a little sign outside saying, we've run out of condoms. Uh, I decided that was never going to happen again. So last year, I delivered a black and yellow tub of condoms balanced carefully on my bike. You know, I'm like riding over. Uh, this year, I thought ahead and just shipped them to the Orgy Dome because that's a hard bike ride, you know? Uh, and so we really have a sort of distributed harm reduction outreach service. But I really think the best way to do harm reduction is bottom up. I really think it has to be by the people who are at risk. It has to come from them. And so that works really well at Burning Man, right? It's a, it's a duocracy. If there's something you, that you want to be here that's not here, it's up to you to bring it. It's actually my favorite part of Burning Man because you're not allowed to complain about something not being here. Oh, I really wish there was a, as soon as you finish that sentence, you own it. You own that sentence now, and now you have to fix it, right? So if you're really upset that there's not a punk bar, it's now on you to bring the punk bar. And so that's my favorite thing about this place. And so it's on us to bring harm reduction. If you're here, you're interested. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just give some tips and share them with your friends. They're on our website. I know that's not super useful right now. I'm actually gonna take some notes that next year I'm gonna print out our tips to give you guys for your camps. I don't know why, this, this is probably the third time I've done this talk at Burning Man. It's the first time it's occurred to me that I shouldn't tell you to go to the website. Um, the first is the buddy system. I know exploring the playa alone, super altered, is really fun. Uh, it's also where people really often end up in trouble. Even if your friend is just as altered as you, two altered minds is better than one, and so you can often figure things out. You can take a vote, right? Uh, so Rick Doblin's an alum from New College. I am as well. So is Lene, who started the Zendo. It's a school with a long history of psychedelic culture. One of my favorite stories is the school is bisected by a, a, a two-lane high, or a four-lane highway, and now there's a bridge over it. But back in the early '60s and '70s, there wasn't a bridge. You just had to get across the highway. And the story is that there would be like a voting process, right? You'd have like 10 of your friends out. You're all super high on mescaline. You're trying to go to the waterfront. So you get to the four lane highway and everybody puts a hand up when they think it's safe to cross. And when you reach a majority, everybody goes. <laughs> it's a great process, right? I mean, 10 altered minds analyzing the situation is probably as good as one sober mind analyzing it. Um, and so, yeah. The buddy system is really a great way to avoid trouble. I, I mean, Zenda will tell you, like, people get brought in all the time who are found alone out on open playa, right? We found this person at the trash fence. You know, we found them outside, you know, at the back of the porta potties. We have no idea who they are, no idea what they took, no idea what the problem is. You deal with it. That's a much harder problem than this is my friend who took LSD four hours ago who's now starting to have a difficult night. We tested the LSD. We know that it's LSD. We feel like it's reaching a point where we can't handle it and we would like some help. That's a super easy situation for Zendo to deal with. Uh, and so just having a friend that knows what you're on, if you absolutely decide you're going to lose a loan, maybe write the dose, time, and substance on your arm where it'll be covered by your sleeve. 
uh, is really helpful because then they know whether this is like a go to the medics or stay in Zendo situation. Just make it as easy for the people who are trying to keep everyone happy, healthy, and alive as humanly possible. Um, another one is just taking time to chill out and take a break, both in the moment when you're on a substance and also just in general at Burning Man. I totally get it. Like You could split yourself into a thousand people and barely scratch the surface of what's happening here. So the impetus to go really hard every night, stay out as late as possible, oh, what's that shiny thing over there? You know, you're trying to get back to camp and a person offers you a magical experience. I, I get it. It's the piece of advice I'm worst at. My wife will attest. Uh -huh. And so just taking the time at Burning Man to like recuperate, regenerate, drink some water, speaking of which, uh, drink some water, uh, eat some food, uh, I've definitely had events where people, events where Zendo's not there, Dance Safe often sort of picks up the post-consumption psychedelic triage part of it. It's not our core mission, but if there's no one else there. And so often I'll, I've asked someone, oh, what did you eat? Meaning what drugs did you consume? And they'll answer like, oh, I, I had a sandwich for breakfast yesterday. And it's like, oh, I wonder where the problem started. I'm having a really hard time figuring this out. Um, hold on one second. But also on MDMA. Uh, MDMA is super often adulterated with a small amount of methamphetamine. It's a really common thing for people to do when they're selling MDMA. It's not even really malicious, it's just that MDMA on its own is a super sort of relaxing, heart opening, almost sedate experience. It's why it works so well for psychotherapy. You can sit on a couch and talk for five hours. You don't have this need to like get up and dance and move. So really early on, people started doing this, pressing pills with a little bit of methamphetamine, five, 10 milligrams. And now people, especially people who are ravers in the late 90s, if you give somebody who was a raver in the late 90s, who's taken a break for a few years, real MDMA, they think you've given them something else. Because they so associate MDMA with this like talkative, speedy, dancey, bouncy experience that they had on 100 milligrams of MDMA and like five or 10 of methamphetamine. And so it's just a really common thing. Uh, and so the, when you're out, you're dancing, you're feeling really good, you know, once an hour, take a minute, sit down, drink some water, take a moment for yourself, feel your, feel your body, right? Feel your heart rate, feel how you're feeling. Uh, check in with yourself because it's a drug that is really good at facilitating connection with self if you're like there with your eyes closed in the dark lying on a couch and really good at facilitating connection with other if you're not if you're up and bouncing and talking and moving and it really seems to be one or the other it's 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 an either or thing that happens with that drug you either connect really really deeply with self or really really deeply with other uh and when you're out there engaging with others it's easy to forget that like i lost a shoe like an hour ago right <laughs> and like you don't notice <laughs> or you haven't had a drink of water in four and a half hours but you're, the first time you take a drink of water is when you're taking your second dose, right? Like that's the first time you've touched your water bottle to your lips as you needed to swallow the next pill. And so taking that time to chill out is, is really, really important. Uh, there's a festival in Germany, I don't know the name, it was a big festival, mostly live music, and they had two stages facing a single crowd. So a, a stage would play here, the music would rage for an hour, the next band would set up on the other stage, that band would end and they would immediately start the music on the other side, right? The, everyone in the crowd would just turn around and the next band would start. And they had like six years in a row where it was like two or three deaths, hundreds of hospitalizations, all these problems. So they got together a huge group of harm reduction consultants online. There was a, a, like a Usenet group. It was like their own interface. Everybody gave like best practices, thoughts and ideas. And literally all they did was they doubled the number of medics. So there used to be one medical tent, now there's two. They tripled the number of free water stations. And they stopped the music for 10 minutes between each set and they announced, everybody refill your water, everybody take 10 minutes to like calm down, sit down, music will start in 10 minutes. And the next year there was like half the number of hospitalizations, no deaths. Like that's all they had to do, 10 minutes of sit down. Right, just everybody sit down, right? Like, <laughs> drink your water. And that's all it took to like massively reduce the number of problems. You know, we suggested on site drug checking. Germany's a little tough. Some places in Europe are really easy. Germany's a little tough. Um, but they didn't do any of that. All they did was more medics, more water, 10 minutes to rest every hour. And they basically fixed the problem they were having. 
Uh, and also electrolytes, particularly out here. Like, don't just drink enough water. Also, like, make sure to drink electrolytes. You sweat so much out here. And if you hyperhydrate, if you change the salt levels in your body because you're sweating out salts and you're just drinking water, it can absolutely kill you. It, it absolutely happens to people who are totally sober. It's a marathon runner issue they used to run into a lot. Marathons have gotten it down now, right? They, they know the problem. Um, and so just taking electrolytes. Uh, my first year at Burning Man in 2008, uh, I, we realized we were having to pee every like four seconds. Like as soon as I was leaving the porta potty, I immediately had to pee again, like as bad as I've ever had to pee in my life. And I saw a dude who looked like he'd been at Burning Man for 12 years. I don't mean he, I, he looked like he'd been coming for 12 years. I mean, he looked like he'd been living on the playa for 12 years, right? And so I was like, this guy will know what's happening. And we told him what the problem. He said, yeah, you don't have any salt in your system, right? You retain water with salt. And if you're sweating and you're just drinking water, you don't have any. And he pulled out a baggie of salt. I mean, he had a baggie of just white powder. One of the most like probable cause things I've ever done at Burning Man. I've been here for like three days. He said, this is just salt, eat some. And it's, as soon as it touches your tongue, your body knows it's getting salt. It's before it can even biochemically work, all the sodium channels in your body start to realign for salt. And you, you feel yourself having to not pee without peeing. It's the most bizarre sensation. The salt touches your tongue and you like, the need to pee just sort of like evaporates back up into you. And so like just getting electrolytes. Uh, if you do choose to consume substances out here, uh, Knowing what they are is super important. Reagent tests are great. Uh, they're not perfect. Like any technology, there are limitations. Uh, the fentanyl test strips are, are a one attempt to address that limitation. So the reagent tests are basically color metric tests. You take you know, six or eight tiny little piles of powder of the substance you're planning on consuming. You put a dropper on each one, and then you line up the color it changed with a chart, and it can give you a pretty good idea of what's in that sample. Uh, Fentanyl is active at such small doses that you can't reagent test for it. So we had to develop a new piece of technology. It's an amino assay strip. Uh, it's the, literally the exact same technology as pregnancy tests. Uh, and so you can dissolve the sample in water, test it with amino assay bacterium, and it'll tell you if there's fentanyl in the sample. Uh, it actually works too well. It will detect fentanyl at a sub-psychoactively uh, dose. So if there's like a even the time, if somebody didn't wipe a scale really, really, really well, the, the sample will get adulterated with enough fentanyl to trick the tests, an amount far lower than a human being would ever feel. Uh, it does let you some, know someone up the chain is fucking with fentanyl, which is an important piece of data, right? I mean, it lets you know that. Um, we're hoping soon that we'll have an FTIR that we can deploy it at festivals. Uh, it's a four-year transformer infrared spectroscopy drug, anal drug analyzing machine. It fires a series of infrared laser beams through the sample. Every molecule absorbs infrared light at slightly different spectrum by lining up the spectral data with the sample. It tells you what is in that sample. This is not, with reagent testing, it's, oh, there's a preponderance of evidence this is MDMA. There might be something new that matches all the colors that we haven't discovered yet. So there's always this like small risk. This is a molecular signature at the molecular level. It cannot be altered, faked, or changed in any way. So if the machine says it's MDMA, it is MDMA, period. There is no possible way to fake this. Uh, and so we're hoping to have, we, we've had one we've been borrowing from a university I've promised, I've promised not to name in public talks. So we have one we've been borrowing from a university. We've used it at 12 events. Uh, it is an absolutely spectacular piece of technology. It's like 70 grand, so we don't have one quite yet. We have a new one we're looking at that we might be able to get that's about 30. That's a much different number. So uh, we're, we're testing a few options about getting one of these. Uh, my, my sincerest hope is that we'll have one in the next like three to four months uh, so that we no longer have to coordinate with this university. They want something that in writing that someone at the festival was okay with it. That's often very hard to negotiate. A lot of what we do is like a wink and a nod. Uh, you know, oh, like we can't have you do drug testing on site. We need you to sign this. I show up and they're like, you brought everything, right? Like, right? Like you have everything to do drug testing. Cause like that was just, I just needed that on paper. Like it's fine. Um, here at Burning Man, I have found through 2008 was our first year. I wasn't involved with DanceSafe back then, but I've always been a drug nerd. Uh, I have found that substantially burners test their drugs at home. They have a sort of duocracy attitude about their substance use. This might be the largest event, well there is no other event of this type, but even ignoring that fact, this might be the largest event in the world where it's damn near impossible to get drugs. 
I mean, it's just really hard to get drugs at Burning Man. If you don't bring your own, the odds are you're not getting high here. Uh, this is a bring your own in community, and that extends from this, right? These massive domes we build, the sound systems, the art cars, the foam experiences, don't call it a shower, uh, you know, 747 nightclub, all the way down to like, the, you know, the drugs people are taking. So of all the criticisms I get for Dance Safe, one of the weirdest is when the org tells me your services aren't as needed at Burning Man because burners take care of their own problems at home. It's the only criticism I get that is, is substantially true. I mean, I have a really, I've walked around with test kits at Burning Man and had a really hard time finding anyone who had drugs that had not already been tested. Uh, but there are people here who don't know about testing. There are people here who, who get their drugs here. And so anywhere people are consuming, I think testing should be here. Uh, if you have substances that you brought and you, your, guy, your guy says he tested them, I recommend you grab a test kit at the end of the talk. I, I truly do. Uh, I understand that everybody trusts the place they get their drugs. You wouldn't buy drugs from someone you didn't trust. I get that. It's not about trusting the guy you get your drugs from. It's about trusting his guy's 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 guy. And I promise you, no matter how much you like your guy, the guy five up the chain you wouldn't hang out with for all drugs. I promise. And so it's just about that. These are unregulated markets. Uh, and so, yeah, testing those substances can be super helpful. Uh, also being cautious when mixing substances. Uh, drug A plus drug B does not always equal experience A plus experience B. There's synergistic effects. There's counterindications that are medically problematic. Uh, and that extends to medications you're taking. Uh, it extends to a lot of things. Uh, Deciding on drug interactions and counterindications in the moment at Burning Man is super hard because you need reliable internet to do this, right? You have to have it. Uh, I'm really hopeful that next, I, I thought I was going to have reliable internet this year. I thought I was going to have it last year. We're currently at 2 for, or 0 for 2. Uh, at some point, I really want there to be a, uh, a little station where you can come and like do some research on substances if you need to do it. Uh, I'm really hopeful to have that next year where you little laptop, you can come check it out. I want to Google some drug combinations. Uh, so deciding what you're going to do at home and doing the research beforehand is really important. Uh, a lot of people really like GHB. A lot of people really like ketamine. A lot of people really like alcohol. If you mix all three of those out here, you might be leaving in a helicopter. Like that's, that's really the most likely outcome if you decide in the moment to mix all three of those substances without knowing what you're doing, without adjusting dosage, without doing that. Like we're not talking Zendo, we're not talking a bad night at camp, we're talking a $30,000 helicopter ride to Reno. And so deciding what you're gonna do at home and doing that research, super important. Uh, getting proper sleep and nutrition, also super important. I'm really bad at it, I totally get it. Try, try your best. Uh, protecting your hearing is another really important part of this puzzle. Uh, my hearing is terrible because of a, like a specific incident where I don't even want to say I passed out. I, like, I lost consciousness on top of a speaker at Boom Festival in 2002. Uh, I'd been going for like four days. I was on the speaker. I leaned over. I blinked, and it was sunrise. Right? Like it wasn't like I made a decision to spend eight hours on top of a speaker. I just I blinked and it happened. You know, uh, and the hearing in my right ear, like from that, like I know what moment it happened in. It's it's not the same. Uh, stem cell technology is coming down the pike. Uh, we're in, I believe, phase two human trials for repairing hearing using stem cells. Either phase one or phase two right now. Maybe eight, ten years out. Boy, I'm gonna hit them up for a sponsorship. You know, if you want to, for Dance Safe, if you want to get in front of hundreds of thousands of people who are very interested in repairing your hearing, I am the guy to talk to. Uh, so I'm going to talk to those. And, and I'd also like to talk to you because, like, I can, you know, on the right side, I can't hear anything. So um, there are earplugs, like I said, at Camp Never Rest, which is the big sound camp right here down the street. They proactively reached out to me and said we would like to have a station with earplugs and condoms at our camp. Can you help facilitate that? So there, it's a camp that... It's the first time ever I've had a sound camp reach out to me and say, we're gonna be playing music really loudly and we wanna protect people's hearing. Uh, so I, I, I really support that. I was really pleased to have that happen. And then we later realized we, we had a bunch of friends at that camp, but it, was, it wasn't that anyone suggested it, it wasn't personal. 
they just wanted to protect the patrons of their camp, and so that's, that's worth knowing about a theme camp, I think. Uh, we have, uh, if you're sexually active, like come prepared with protection. If you didn't come prepared, uh, outside of the Foam Dome at Camp Never Rest and at the Orgy Dome and at Spanky's Wine Bar. Those are the four camps that I shipped just like an utterly absurd number of condoms to. Like maybe four or five bathtubs worth of condoms would have been a fun photo shoot, right? Like in the back. Um, so there's lots of condoms. Uh, how are we doing on time, Joe? What's 10 minutes? Beautiful. I'm actually on time. This is amazing. Uh, knowing your rights is a super important part of harm reduction. For most of the drugs that are popular at Burning Man, the most dangerous and most likely dangerous outcome is getting caught with those drugs. That's the thing most likely to hurt you about the drugs, which is a fucked up political conversation on another level, uh, but also just something to know. I did a whole Flex Your Rights talk yesterday at Entheos. There's Entheos and Entheo Generation. Did you know that? Those are separate camps. I don't know if you know that, knew that. Uh, but just knowing that at any time you have the right to ask an officer, am I free to leave? And if you're free to leave, leave. And if you're not free to leave, shut up. Like you're not gonna talk yourself out of a detention. So as soon as they say they're not free to leave, the only thing you say is this is my legal name, this is my date of birth, this is my address, I want an attorney. In Nevada, you're legally required to give those three pieces of information. You can't lie about them. As soon as you're detained, you have to give them name, date of birth, and address. You do not have to give them an ID. They'll lie and say you do. Let's go back to your camp and get your driver's license. That's a lie. You have to identify. You do not have to have ID. So identify, name, date of birth, physical address, like I live at this address in the default world. I do not consent to searches, I want an attorney. And that's all you tell them. Those, those five pieces of information are all you're legally required to give. You're never gonna just be so friendly to the cops that they let you go once they found the baggie of cocaine, right? Oh, if you just answer some questions, maybe we'll write you a ticket. Where's your camp? All they want to do is toss your camp, and they can. Once they found one camp made with drugs, they can search your camp. So don't take them there. So that's it. Name, date of birth, address. I do not consent to searches. I want an attorney. That's all you give them. Uh, and also practice safer snorting. Um, we actually did not bring safer snorting cards. Uh, Kristen, Jess, is one of you here? Is one of you here and free? I think they stepped outside. It's uh, Emily, you over there? Are you... Do you want to go grab some safer snorting cards real quick? They're in the cabinet, the supplies cabinet. You can you, okay, cool. Uh, your nose is a bodily orifice with a mucous membrane, and you absolutely have to treat it like one. We got it taken care of. Don't worry about it. We're good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, your nose is a mucous, a bodily orifice with a mucous membrane. Sharing keys is like when you're snorting powder out of a baggie is the biological equivalent of having unprotected sex with every person in that room. There are documented cases of hep C and hep A being transmitted that way. There are strongly suspected cases of, of HIV being transmitted that way, right? Little tiny microscopic cuts in your nose, bleeding on the key. You dip it back in the baggie, the next person snorts it. You've now transmitted blood directly into that person's sinus cavity. The blood that travels through your sinus cavity goes directly into your brain. It does not go through your liver before it goes through your brain. It's a direct it bypasses your lymphatic system. That's actually why it's such an efficient means of drug delivery to your brain, right? Like when you, when you snort ketamine, there is not like a delay, right? It's not like there's like you got it. It's not like you have time to like go back to your camp once you've snorted the line of ketamine. If you take a pill, you might have some time, right? You have a some moments to gather yourself because it's d dissolving in your stomach and then going through your blood, it hits your lymphatic system and then it goes into your brain. This is straight into your brain. And if a virus gets straight into your brain, it's in you. It's in you, and it's like it's not getting out. And so this is a real thing. So we have little, uh, we used to give out big bowls of pre-cut straws, always UV reactive straws with a black light over them. Boy, that's a conversation starter. Uh, promoters often had a problem with this. Can't imagine. Uh, and so uh, we've switched to uh, organic hemp business cards that are printed with organic ink. They have information about hep C on the back. They're perforated twice, so they, roll, they tear and roll into three individual single-use snorting straws. Uh, so we'll have those here as well if you guys want to grab a stack for camp. Um, they're super expensive to print, and we actually have a burner who gives a donation every year for us to print uh, 10,000 of them at 25 cents a piece. Uh, because he has hepatitis from this, from doing this. 
Um, there was one incident where he shot speed, but he, uh, he, he used a, a clean rig and, and he used to share straws all the time. So he strongly suspects it was from sharing straws is how he got hep C. There's a cure now for hep C. It costs like 15 grand, the cure. Um, and so he figures if he can throw, you know, 2,500 a year at safer snorting straws and prevent one case, he has saved someone without even knowing it. He's, he's created a net economic gain of $7,500 for the world without that person even knowing he did it. Um, and so he does it every year. He gives us his donation every year to do this. Um, Having a sober driver, not a problem for most people at Burning Man. If you own an art car, like, you know the rules you agree to. We all know how often they're broken. Um, really, non-sober drivers on art cars really bothers me. It really does. Uh, I was very nearly obliterated by an art car, which is no longer at Burning Man because of how they behaved. Um, and so I'm not going to out an individual art car, even though they're no longer here, and even though they were assholes, I'm not going to out them. Um, but there was a dust storm so severe and a driver so intoxicated that he missed my wife and I by like inches. He missed us so, so closely that as he was driving by, I was able to jump up and punch the driver's side window. And the driver slams on the brake and throws it in, in park and opens the window and starts fighting with me through the window. And so I'm fighting back and he steps out. It was going to get physical. And I took three steps back and he couldn't find me. That's how dusty it was. So like, if you're that close to me and you're that drunk, like, I don't want you at Burning Man, realistically. And the org agreed. Um, and so, if you're gonna, also if you're gonna be intoxicated driving a massive art car and fighting with someone at Burning Man, check first to see if they currently work for Burning Man. You know? Um, and so, yeah. Uh, but not just looking out for yourself, looking out for others. Like, this really is a duocracy. If you see someone who looks like they might be having a hard time, like, Tap them on the shoulder, see how they're doing, ask if they're, don't ask are you okay, because that can often send things in a, am I okay? I don't know, what's going on, right? Uh, has, ask how they're doing, is this a slightly better phrasing for people who might be altered, particularly on psychedelics? If they're not doing okay, the Zendo's at six and three keyhole, or uh, six and three and nine keyholes, there is no six keyhole, three and nine keyholes. Uh, there's also the Queer Dome. Uh, there's also a rangers sanctuary. Rangers are everywhere. The BLM rangers, the guys in the cop cars, I would not necessarily bring someone to unless you felt like it was a medical situation. The Black Rock rangers are just burners. They're just people who are here providing services for the community. They're just like you and I. They will never take someone to the cops who shouldn't be taken to the police. And I mean that in an I agree shouldn't. Non-consensual dosing, sexual assault. You know what? Like, let's get the police involved, right? Like, let's let's... Back on, off, it's okay. I'm loud as shit, I'm not worried about it. Oh. Testing, oh, look at that. I think it's even louder, that's amazing. Um, so looking out for others, and also coming prepared. And that just doesn't mean for like, for Burning Man in general. I mean, obviously we hammer that in over and over and over and over again, but like, really, test your substances at home. It's much easier to use a test kit in a well-lit kitchen when you just got eight hours of sleep in your air-conditioned bed and have time to read the directions and can check things on the internet and can email me if you need to. Like, it's so much easier to do testing in that environment than it is in this environment. Um, I, I mean, I probably run thousands of tests a year and I'll, I'll have moments at Burning Man where I'm testing for someone where I like, I have to take a moment and check in and look at the chart. And I mean, I always look at the chart on principle, but very often it's confirming, right? It's like just making sure that I'm like remembering everything correctly. Out here, I use the chart. I'm like, I'm, I use it uh, because I'm sleep depth and I'm like, I'm a burner too, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm out here working-ish, right? I mean, I'm, I'm here to have fun. Uh, and so coming prepared, uh, two minutes, uh, two minute Q&A. There's a few other things I wanted to say, but I want to get questions and answers. Does anyone have anything they want to, they want to ask me? If not, I'll say the other few things I wanted to say. Oh, beautiful, I get, this, I get to end on my favorite rant. Uh, these are drug prohibition problems and we are not gonna fix them until we legalize and regulate all drugs. All, capital A, capital L, capital L. I'm not saying that we should sell heroin and methamphetamine at 7-Eleven. There's a galaxy of regulatory possibilities between prohibition and selling them at 7-Eleven. I am also, 100% saying it would be better to sell them at 7-Eleven than what we do now. Saying that. And I'm saying that in front of at least one of my board members and maybe two. This is a, I, I'm all in on that statement. Uh, fentanyl and heroin is killing people because heroin is not legal. 
People who are afraid to call 911 when their friends overdose, those people are dying because the drugs are not legal. MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin deaths are incredibly rare. And I actually think that the fact that we're focusing on legalizing the sexy drugs first is a strategic and moral error. I think that we have an obligation to be talking about the dangerous drugs first. I get that the political optics are a little easier with psilocybin, and I'm proud of the people who are doing the psilocybin legalization stuff. I am, I think it's good, I think it's important, I think psilocybin, of course, should be legal. More people have died during my talk from heroin than have ever died from mushrooms, right? It's just, it's 100% certainty that that's true. So like, it should be heroin first. We should be having this conversation. Heroin is so intrinsically dangerous that we cannot leave the control of the marketplace to criminal gangs. We, as a society, have to control it. We need drug control. And prohibition is not drug control. Drug control is that when you go to the store and you buy a beer at 3.1% alcohol, you not only know with 100% certainty that that beer is 3.1% alcohol, but we can scan the barcode on that beer and we can know which retailer sold it on which day. We know which truck brought it to that retailer. We know which warehouse it was at before it was on that truck. We know which truck brought it to that warehouse. And we know the person at the facility who, who was running the machine that canned the beer. That's drug control. And that's what we need for all of the drugs. That's what we need for heroin all the way to LSD. I want barcodes on our LSD. I want barcodes on our jars of heroin. And until we have that, these, these deaths are not going to end. So that's it. We have to do it. So thank you guys for coming to my talk. Thank you, Joe. Fucking love you, man. This guy right here is making so much magic happen for Burning Man, for MAPS. I fucking love it, so thank you.